Hello, and welcome to this whiteboard presentation on the Xi Jing or the Book of Odes. Let's begin with Confucius's idea about the Odes. Let's first look at Analect 17.9. The Master said, Little ones, why do none of you learn the Odes? The Odes can be a source of inspiration and a basis for evaluation. They can help you come together with others as well as to properly express complaints. In the home, they teach you about how to serve your father, and in public life, they teach you about how to serve your Lord. They also broadly acquaint you with the names of various birds, beasts, plants, and trees. Let's take a look at the first ode. Guan Guan go the ospreys on the islet in the river, the modest, retiring, virtuous young lady, for our prince a good mate she. Here long, there short, is the duckweed, to the left, to the right, borne about by the current, the modest, retiring, virtuous young lady. Waking and sleeping, he sought her. He sought her and found her not. And waking and sleeping, he thought about her. Long, he thought, oh, long and anxiously. On his side, on his back, he turned and back again. Here long, there short, is the duckweed. On the left, on the right, we gather it. The modest, retiring, virtuous young lady, with lutes, small and large, let us give her friendly welcome. Here long, there short, is the duckweed. On the left, on the right, we cook and present it. The modest, retiring, virtuous young lady, with bells and drums, let us show our delight in her. Recall that at Analect 17.9, Confucius had drawn our attention to the fact that the odes also broadly acquaint you with the names of various birds, beasts, plants, and trees. We've seen some of that here in the first ode. For example, what in the world is an osprey? It's a fish hawk. And recall these lines from the first ode. Here long, there short, is the duckweed, to the left, to the right, borne about by the current. But what is duckweed? Uh -huh. 
it's that stuff floating on the water here. Do you get the picture of what's going on here in the first ode? There is a slow-moving stream with an islet in it, and the slow-moving waters are at least partially covered by duckweed. There are screeches from ospreys, some on the islet, and perhaps some above in the air. Maybe an osprey swoops down and snatches a fish from the duckweed-covered waters. And then there is the modest, retiring, virtuous young lady whom we welcome and who would be a nice match for our prince. At Analex 3.20, here is what Confucius says about the first ode. The master said, The cry of the osprey expresses joy without becoming licentious, and expresses sorrow without falling into excessive pathos. There are two links. There are links to two YouTube videos of crying ospreys on Learning Suite. They are found on YouTube at the following URLs. There is also a link on Learning Suite to a YouTube video of an exquisitely beautiful version of the first ode being sung. It is found on YouTube at the following URL. The second ode sings of dolichos, whatever those are. And the third one of mouse ear. It's not all about flora and fauna, though. Here is a teaching from Confucius's son, Bo Yu. In the Analects, Bo Yu tells how his father told him to study the odes. Zichin asked Bo Yu, Have you acquired any esoteric learning? Bo Yu replied, I have not. My father was once standing by himself in the courtyard, and as I hurried by with quickened steps, he asked, Have you learned the odes? I replied, Not yet. He said, If you do not learn the odes, you will lack the means to speak. That's from Analex 16.13. On Confucius's account to his son, then, the odes teach us how to speak. Let us also recall that Confucius at Analect 17.9 primarily recommends the Odes for improving ourselves in various kinds of ways. He says they inspire us. They teach us how to associate appropriately with others and how to appropriately register a complaint. They teach us about the virtue of filial piety and about loyalty. In short, the odes help us to develop virtue.
The Xi Jing can perhaps be usefully compared to the book of Psalms in the Bible. Think of how Psalms was such a source of inspiration that President George W. Bush appealed to the 23rd Psalm on 9-11-2001. In this song and others, the Psalms provide lyrical illustrations of virtue. And in the way that the classical Chinese philosophers quote generously from the Xi Jing, in the New Testament, Jesus quotes more frequently from the Psalms than from any other source. As was just mentioned, Confucius, who is said to have sung all 300 songs of the Xi Jing, was not alone among the classical philosophers in seeking lyrical support for philosophical insight. All seven of the classical Chinese philosophers that we study Confucius, Mota, Mengzi, Lao Tzu, Duangzi, Shunzi, and Han Feizi utilize the Xi Jing in their writings. We cannot, though, regard all of the classical philosophers as giving the Xi Jing the same kind of importance. It is particularly important to the Confucians. Confucius. Mengzi and Shunzi. But also for the non Confucian, Mozi. The relation of the Xi Jing to the other classical philosophers. Lao Tzu, Zhuangzi, and Han Feizi is more ambiguous. The philosopher Moza supports his social philosophy with this citation of Ode 257. I admonish you to take thought of the needy. I teach you how to assign the titles. For who can take hold of something hot without first moistening his hand? Notice how Mozza uses the odes in this passage. There are no words that are not answered, no kindness that is not requited. Throw me a peach. I'll requit you a plum.
The first two lines are from Ode 256. The second two lines are an adaptation of Ode 64. Moza uses the odes to illustrate what may be the most fundamental idea of morality, reciprocity. Mungza recites Ode 154 about the toils of common life when he presents his ideas of property reform. In the morn go you for reeds, at dusk go you and weave. Hurriedly they climb to mend the roof, they begin to sow the hundred grains. Mungza recites frequently from the odes. The Taoists, Lao Tzu and Zhuangzi, are a little different in their usage of the Xi Jing. In the classic attributed to him, the Tao Da Jing, Lao Tzu can be thought of as presenting his own classic of poetry. Lao Tzu does not explicitly quote from the Xi Jing. We find, however, that the ideas of the Xi Jing are sometimes implicit in the Tao Da Jing. For example, the most famous pair of lines in all of Chinese philosophy are perhaps the first two lines of the Tao Da Jing. The way that can be followed is not the constant way. A name that can be named is not a constant way, is not a constant name. This is probably the central idea in Taoism, but it has a clear antecedent in Ode 56. The tribulus grows on the wall and cannot be brushed away. The story of the inner chamber cannot be told. What would have to be told would be the vilest of recitals. The tribulus grows on the wall and cannot be removed. The story of the inner chamber cannot be particularly related. What might be particularly related would be a long story. The tribulus grows on the wall and cannot be bound together and taken away. The story of the inner chamber cannot be recited. What might be recited would be the most disgraceful of things. Zhuangzi apparently never recites directly from the odes. He knows them, however, and his modus operandi is to some extent that of mocking the Confucians. He mocks their love of history by making up his own episodes of it and attributing them to non-existing classics. We may wonder if some of his frequent recourse to verse is of this nature. In one and possibly two places, though, he makes reference to the odes. In one of these places, he very oddly says that the odes are about will. 
This has led to considerable literary discussion. Like Confucius and Mengzi, the Confucian philosopher Shunzi quotes often from the Xi Jing. The idea of ritual is very important for him, and he uses the odes to buttress this importance. Here is just one example of many that might be cited. He quotes twice from Ode 209. Their rituals and ceremonies completely follow the proper measure. Their laughter and speech are completely appropriate. Hun Fates is quite ambiguous with respect to the Xi Jing. He does quote directly from the Odes, um, these lines that are perhaps the most in keeping with his legalist philosophy in the whole Xi Jing. Under the wide heaven, all is the king's hand, land. Within the sea boundaries of the land, all are the king's servants. Hunt Feitza, though, ambiguates his usage of this passage by putting it into the mouth of an unnamed character in a brief narrative. We essentially get the passage third hand. By tradition, Hunt Feitza studied with Shunza, but he in no way gives the same importance to the Xi Jing that his teacher did. By the end of Han Feitz's text, we may think that he favors suppressing people who study the Xi Jing. As we have seen, the odes are very often pastoral. Sometimes, though, they take a religious tone, as in Ode 255. How vast is God, the ruler of men below? How arrayed in terrors is God, with many things irregular in his ordinations? Heaven gave birth to the multitudes of people, but the nature it confers is not to be depended on. All are good at first, but few prove themselves to be so at the last. And notice this wonderful piece from Ode 192. Look to heaven all dark, but let its determination be fixed, and there is none whom, whom it will not overcome. There is the great God. Does he hate anyone? As we saw when discussing Shunza, Sometimes the Xi Jing points to ritual, as in Ode 209. We are very much exhausted and have performed every ceremony without error. The able priest announced the will of the spirits and goes to the filial descendant to convey it. 
fragrant has been your filial sacrifice, and the spirits have enjoyed your spirits and viands. They confer upon you a hundred blessings, each as it is desired, each as sure as law. You have been exact and expeditious. You have been correct and careful. They will ever confer on you the choicest favors, in myriads and tens of myriads. And sometimes the Odes glorify the former kings, and especially the early Zhou dynasty kings, Wen and Wu, as in Ode 235. King Wen is on high. Oh, bright is he in heaven. Although Zhou was an old country, the favoring appointment lighted on it recently. Illustrious was the house of Zhou, and the appointment of God came at the proper season. King Wen ascends and descends on the left and the right of God. So we come to the end of our investigation of the Xi Jing. We have learned of its pastoral content, its relation to the principal seven classical philosophers, of its religious content, of its ritual content, and of its glorifying content.